again because the, that tour was so long, just living in this kind of cuckoo clock of, um, of excess. We took a lot of drugs and partied and did what we wanted. You can't just, just turn that off. Once the tour was over, that's when I think the, the line blurred between um, leisure time and uh, work time. Moving on from coming up to head music, we'd, we'd, we'd moved houses and it became darker. There was uh, darker drugs. There was, uh, if I could say it, there was a lot of crack cocaine and, and heroin. And that changed the whole, the whole climate, the whole atmosphere changed. Um, and yes, it, it changed, it changed. I know that sounds so well. <laughs> it was kind of horrible, actually. I hated it. I remember scurrying up and down this alleyway at various ungodly hours. I bought this place, I think it was at the end of the coming up tour. It's an odd place, and it's unobserved. It felt like you didn't have to abide by the, the usual laws of society. So we didn't. When it comes to excess and addiction and, you know, using, people expected that, especially of him. And that's not a good position to be in, where people are going, go on, fuck up, you know, and that's what they were doing. Um, and he kind of did. I can't use words like drugs because I just sort of find it hard to hard to talk in those terms um, and I'm not fooling anyone by not using those words but I personally find it really difficult so I have to talk it in broader terms. I think I deep down knew that I was in real trouble but I think I justified my addiction by sort of seeing it as part of some sort of rock and roll mythology that justified it. Brett just became a very different person, very different. Hardly ever saw him, you know. N never used to go out, never used to sort of hang out a lot there because it was something I, I wasn't interested in. I just didn't want to get into that. When we started writing head music, which was only a couple of months after the end of the coming up to I was living in a different house by this point, and I didn't used to like going there because there were various characters hanging around who weren't friends of the band. They were, you know, drug people, basically, and they were all a bit sinister. And, um, and so I didn't like going to his house. So that removed quite a key part of the human personal connection that you need for songwriting. I'd pop round to Brett's, and he'd be off his head. You just roll your eyes and go home, and you say, I can't hang around with these people, <laughs> you know? But you'd go home and you'd carry on. I think Brett's main idea for head music was we're going to make a Prince record. It's going to be a groove-based thing with kind of minimalistic musical ideas, and it's going to sound quite kind of cold as well. That'll be the suede part of it. It'll be cold and icy and, and dark. The music that Richard and I coming up with wasn't quite exciting Brett or kind of pressing his buttons so he started writing stuff himself you know and it was like Ride on Time by Black Box and it's do you know what I mean it's like I, I was there with everything will flow and leaving and these songs that you know that, that I was coming up with at the time and it's like I can't do that you know I did but I, ne I never said that to him but it was like the strangest thing in the world is like this, what the hell is this record going to sound like? He just was like into noises. He was staying up in the, in, until three o'clock in the morning. He had a Juno synth and he'd just go and he'd come to me and say, I want a riff that goes
There's no notes in there. There's no tune in there. It was all about a kind of uh, aggressiveness and attitude. If I'd have been around, I'd have said dreadful mistake because Suede is a guitar band. That's what Suede is, it's a guitar band. It didn't seem like Brett was fully himself. He, he was in his addiction. He wasn't able to write in the same way, there wasn't the same depth. So give me this and give me that smoke for me and give me some of that bad stuff. I feel real now, talking that sugar and shaking that stuff. Can't Get Enough was almost the, the tipping point between, you know, I can't get enough drugs, that's what the song's about. So with this set of quite eclectic demos, we went into East Coast Studios to record head music with a new producer. I remember Brett saying we're going to try a new producer. I think mm, that's not that's not a good thing to do. I think we should stick with Ed. He's he's always been, you know, part of the band here. Really, the sort of sixth member of the band. We changed producers. Steve Osborne produced that record. Steve Osborne was known for his work with the Happy Mondays and sort of dance bands and beats and stuff, and not really with guitar bands. Looking at it, it was absolutely the wrong thing to do because Steve, you know, very talented guy, but he didn't have the history with Suede. He didn't have that kind of paternal instinct almost that Ed's always had with the band. Oh, that was like a bit, a bit too literal. Yeah, but I quite like that. I know it's kind of like a bit corny, but... He had been told clearly this is not a guitar record. So I think he didn't want to kind of view my contributions to the record as, you know, a, a crux, essential thing, you know, in the way that they were for coming up, and, and especially on the first two albums as well, it was all about the guitars. You would spend a long time recording guitars with that. It'd be weeks and weeks and weeks. Steve's much more kind of like, let's take these raw materials and play with them. You know what I mean? He'd get Richard to come in and play guitar for two minutes and then go, right, now we've got two hours turning that into something. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a mixer as much as a, a recorder. For me personally, I didn't enjoy doing a couple of bars of Can't Get Enough and then having it looped. I'd have rather played the whole song, you know, live like we normally do. I would kind of sit there in the control room and listen to what Steve Osborne and Ben Hilly were doing, but be completely unable to contribute because I don't know anything about loops and synths and grooves, and at least, at least I didn't then. All I knew about was how to put a killer guitar line together, and that was just was the one thing that wasn't required. So I felt like a fifth wheel, literally. We didn't feel like a complete unit anymore. You know, Brett was never to be seen. I hardly ever saw him in the studio. Having Establish myself as the hub of the band, I suddenly wasn't really there. I wasn't really present. And so <laughs> it's like kind of the keystone is missing in the building. Everything became slightly atomized, and I drifted off, and Richard drifted off, and Neil drifted off, and it became this odd record that was sort of like almost made <laughs> by Matt and Steve Osborne in a funny sort of way. It was horrible. It was, yeah, it was really stressful. I mean, I don't want to give the impression that what was happening was I was here making the record because no one was here. I was here out of politeness more than anything because it just seemed rude to leave Steve <laughs> here on his own with this, with this kind of like these satellites orbiting around him every now and then beaming a message in. Matt was there more than any other member of the band, and that's crazy, crazy way to make a record. I think you two need to start your communication. That's it. Well, I Steve, think we can rewind that. that. I remember this so clearly. If he'd been doing crack, he'd push his hair back so he 